The American Society on Aging was founded in 1954. 66 years later, people are living prosperous and longer lives. However, many are living with social and economic inequities and inequalities. And the pandemic, it has reminded us that this country doesn't embrace aging. What will happen in 10 years when one in five Americans will be over 65? The American Society on Aging is transforming itself to tackle the challenges and invest in the opportunities that this demographic change will bring. The new ASA reflects our year-long programming and meaningful membership experience. The new ASA reflects our commitment to unite, to empower, and to champion all of you. But most importantly, the new ASA reflects our optimism for the future of aging. On behalf of everyone at the American Society on Aging, I am proud to introduce you to the new ASA. Learn more and join us at www.asaging.org. Welcome, everyone. I'm Ken Dykewald. I'm your host and moderator for the Legacy Interviews. And I would tell you for today's session, fasten your seatbelts because you're about to take a swift ride to the future of health, medicine, and aging with Dr. Terry Fulmer. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Terry. Terry Fulmer, PhD, RN, is president of the John A. Hartford Foundation, a national philanthropy dedicated to improving the care of older adults. She serves as the foundation's chief strategist, and her vision for better care of older adults is catalyzing the age-friendly health system social movement nationwide. Dr. Fulmer is nationally and internationally recognized as one of the world's foremost experts in geriatrics. Terry received her MA in clinical nursing and her PhD in higher education administration with distinguished honors from Boston College. She also is a geriatric nurse practitioner and earned this certification from NYU. She served as Dean of Health Sciences at Northeastern University and was the founding Dean of the NYU College of Nursing. She has also held senior academic positions, get ready for this, at Yale, Columbia, the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard. A true trailblazer, she was the very first nurse to have served on the board of the American Geriatric Society and the first nurse to have served as president of the Gerontological Society of America. A next avenue influencer in aging, she's contributed to nearly 400 publications, textbooks, monographs, editorials, and congressional testimonials. Welcome, Terry Fulmer. Thank you so much, Ken. I couldn't be more pleased than to join you today. Well, Terry, before we get into some serious issues, let's have some fun looking at some pictures over the course of your life. So I've got one up here. We've got these four lovely children. Tell me which one you are and tell me something about this picture. Those are my siblings, Ken, and that's my sister, Kathy, my sister, Patty, me and my brother, Fran. And uh, that picture is one that makes me smile. Was there a particular moment in your life that was going on or your family's life at this point? Yeah, um, my mother was a widow with four kids. And um, my dad died when I was three. And my mother took this picture uh, a while, not too long after that, in order to sort of cheer us up. Okay, now we've got a picture. You're sitting beside a older individual in a hospital bed. Uh, so this is a few years downstream. So that picture was at the NYU Langone Medical Center where I um, go on service as a nurse attending. And that was uh, actually during a period of time when I was consulting on one of the uh, medical units. Now I've got one that I think I'm into. So I think this is from 1987, Terry. You, this is a long time ago. And that's 
Bob Butler, you and me, and we're doing a program with Ted Koppel. You would have only been in your early 30s in your life at that point, but yet you were viewed as probably the premier expert on geriatric nursing. Uh, Did that come along so young for you? Well, and let me first say that that was a remarkable opportunity for me to work with you and Bob Butler and be interviewed by Ted Koppel. I remember he was not necessarily a warm and fuzzy interviewer, (laughs) Uh, but he was very good at what he did. And it was, uh, and it was educational on so many fronts. So it was, it was really very memorable to me. And your question about how I got into geriatrics so quickly is one that we'll talk about, but mm-hmm. um, it was pretty wide open field. There was nobody who uh, was stepping up and I saw an incredible void, which was upsetting to me. And I, I have never looked back. And we're gonna dive into that in detail. Now we've got a picture with a group of folks. Looks like Martha Stewart next to you. Tell me a little bit about this picture. That was a great event. We did that event with WebMD and the Johnny Hartford Foundation along with WebMD had, uh, uh, we had conducted a survey and we were releasing the results publicly. And so with John White is the, uh, the chief medical officer at WebMD, really fun guy to work with. And so he helped us craft this special event to release our data and Al Sue from Mount Sinai in New York helped us invite Martha Stewart, who is really very devoted to the topic. I mean, she has funded a beautiful uh, unit at Mount Sinai dedicated to care of older adults. She is very articulate. She's very smart. I'm sure you've spoken to her. And she made the, of course, she made it very fancy. Hmm. All right, now I've got a picture. Looks like a lovely family and you're right in the center. Introduce us to your family here. This is my wonderful husband, Keith, with whom I've been married 46 years. And actually, we started dating in ninth grade. (laughs) My beautiful daughter, Nina, Holly, and my son, Sam. And they are the lights of my life. And we also have an additional family member now because my son, Sam, was married last year to his beautiful wife, Julie. So it's a... It's a gift every day. Well, congratulations to you, my friend, for such a wonderful family in the midst of this high intensity life. Now, let's let's jump into some topics here. Did you always want to work in healthcare? And were there were there other nurses in your gang? <laughs> that's that's a great question, Ken. And I always wanted to be a nurse from my earliest recognition that people had careers and that I would be uh, in a workforce one day. I wanted to be a nurse because my mother was a nurse. She was in the cadet uh, army program at Syracuse University in nursing. And I just thought that she was so skilled and so knowledgeable that that was the path for me. Her twin sister was also a nurse. My sister Kathy's a nurse, my daughter Holly's a nurse, and I probably have four or five, I know I have four or five aunts and several cousins. So it's, uh, we're all pretty passionate about the discipline and I would never choose anything but. So explain to me from your vantage point, what is it that medicine does? What is it that nursing does? People ask that, people ask that question and If you were to look at materials on the website of the American Nurses Association, there's a phrase that says, physicians treat disease and nurses treat human response to disease. And I think that that's kind of a beautiful way to sum it up, although it it does create, uh, you know, it does give a little short shrift to physicians who certainly care about the humane aspects of work with that. That's pretty true. And, and I think that our, we are in the work, nurses are in the work of comfort and safety, whether that be physical or psychological. We are in the business of physical and psychological comfort and safety every moment of our days, whether you're in an emergency room or in a homeless shelter or no matter where you are, that's our work. The ability for you and nurses to provide 
comfort and safety? Is that because of your nature as a person or is it because of skills you've learned? I would say I would say it's a combination of both. Certainly, that's a part of the curriculum is to think about the way in which I, I actually taught a course at NYU called Comfort and Suffering. So I thought a lot about it. And um, that course I taught to freshmen undergrads in arts and sciences in the fall and to senior nursing students in the spring. And it was very interesting and, and very fun for me to think about the different ways that those young people would be listening. So comfort and safety. So around the time that you were stepping into your professional role, there was a book that came out, House of God, written by Stephen Bergman, under the name Samuel Shem, which he introduced the word gomers. Did you ever hear that word spoken and what is it? I learned that word when I got to the Beth Israel Hospital in 1975 because he had been there the year before I got there and that was exactly the location he was writing about. And it was exactly the house staff he was writing about. And I hated the book. I thought it was insulting on every level. I thought the term Gomer was. What does it mean? What does Gomer mean? It means get out of my emergency room or it means grand old man of the emergency room, but mostly it means get out of my emergency room. And it has to do with disdain and um, just, just disinterest in care of older adults who may be suffering from dementia or chronic diseases that bring them in regularly because we fail to take care of them in a better way when they're not in the emergency room. So, and, and you and I, our friend <clears throat> Bob Butler, he's used to mention to me that he felt the doctors had the Yavis syndrome. They wanted patients who were young, attractive, verbal, intelligent, and single. So in the midst of all of that, you decide you're going to make a turn and aim your career in the direction of care for older adults. Why? I did have never heard that term that you just mentioned for Bob Butler. And it's so true. He was such a wise man. So um, when I got my first position, I was on a general medical unit and most of the, um, most of the patients were older. Very many of them were over 65, over 85. And if I went to a, if I went to one of the house staff and said, my patient isn't eating, what do you want me to do? They'd say, I don't know, do whatever you usually do. Okay. My patient uh, is uh, incontinent. What should I do? Don't ask me. That's not my job. That's your job. Okay. So, you know, my patient's confused and on it went. And they talked about something else there. They talked about vitamin H. And what vitamin H was, was Haldol. And Haldol, as you know, is a medication that uh, is um, one that sedates older people who are having acute delirium. So all that said to me, I have work to do. And it is it struck me as grossly unfair that we would do what I refer to as save them and scorn them. They were very interesting if they had an interesting arrhythmia or an interesting type of multiple myeloma, but they were no longer interesting when it came to things that would actually create very dire consequences and lead also to iatrogenesis while they're in the hospital. That means and hospital. Iatrogenesis, if you can sure. <clears throat> if you can explain to folks what that word means. In order to ex the best way to explain iatrogenesis is it's uh, a malady that occurs to you in the hospital that was caused by the hospital. And so <clears throat> that's iatrogenesis. So for example, you didn't have a bed sore. Now you've got one. You were not incontinent. Now you are. You were not confused. Now you are. Iatrogenesis. So Ivan Illich wrote Medical Nemesis <clears throat> back in the 70s and introduced that concept. Have we fixed all of that? We have not fixed all of that. We have not fixed all of that. And uh, but we are, um, I would say, at a at a tipping point for progress in this country. Everybody is ready. And okay. maybe. Go ahead. Pause right there at the tipping point, because I'm going to stay back in that era a little bit. Okay. Um, so you're a nurse. 
And then you get additional degrees and then you become a geriatric nurse practitioner. Uh, and in a little while you become an academician and, and now you're managing a massive amount of money and funding projects all over the country and impacting the world. But back then, Terry, uh, you've been referred to as a second generation geriatric nurse practitioner. What does that mean? What was the generation before you and what did you bring the field towards then? The uh, being referred to as the second generation is a great compliment. And uh, the first generation were people like Maddie Mezzi, people like Doris Schwartz, uh, Edna Stilwell, who was the founding editor of the Journal of Gerontological Nursing. So there were people who were Priscilla Ebersol, for example, who wrote a wonderful textbook on geriatric nursing and is still sends me a Christmas card every year. I'm mm. so fortunate. But that, that group of people really uh, were defining the field of geriatric nursing, which did not exist until they began to work with the American Nurses Association and carve that out. So you're saying the field of geriatric nursing has literally come alive in your lifetime and you've been, my word, you've been sort of at the vortex of it. You've, you've coined the scope of the practice spices. Can uh -huh. you tell us what you think what does that mean and what should the scope of the practice be? As, as so when I coined the term spices Ken it was a it was more of an acronym to facilitate best practices in geriatric nursing care and I was at Yale New Haven at that point and I was the um, director of the geriatric nursing clinical track at the school and I was director of geriatric nursing at Yale New Haven and mm -hmm. so that was also where I started the geriatric resource nurse program in a very deep and meaningful way, which had begun a, earlier at the Beth Israel, but it really, the formation and development was at Yale. But SPICES was a way to capture the focus of practicing nurses who very often get asked to add one more thing, add one more thing. And so you have to make things sharp, meaningful, and useful when you are working with busy nurses. And so I learned that if I went into the intensive care unit and said, I'm Terry Fulmer, I'm a geriatric nurse expert, can I help you? They'd say, no, you can't, I'm all set today. But if I said, you know, I'm, I'd like to talk to you about your patient, do any of your patients have problem with what I'll call spices, skin problems, problems with eating and feeding, incontinence, confusion, evidence of falls or sleep disorders, then they'd say, oh yeah, I've got that. You can help me with that. So it was a very easy way to engage them. And then they also had um, a heads up as to what I was gonna ask them about every time I saw them. And so it worked very well and it does to this day. There's There are a lot of nurses out there working with the SPICES acronym as a way to drive improvements in clinical practice, which always just thrills me. So I need to ask you, so you want to be a nurse. <clears throat> but you apparently have also been an innovator, which is not necessarily the same as being a nurse. And also you've been a salesperson to try to persuade people of the importance of things. How hard was it for you to arm up with those additional capabilities? Um, I never thought of it as hard. What I did was I was a pretty astute observer of people who did things well. And um, I, in several faces are coming to mind. And I, I, I'm a pretty quick learner. And so watching that, I was able to discern what would be the different ways that would give me more um, engagement from others in the work I was really so hopeful that they would join me in. So this was all taking place during an era of American history that was massively focused on youth. Did you face adversity? Did people say, you know, not her again? Uh, and how, how'd, you, how'd you get through it? What drove you? What, so what drives me every day is the, the older person in front of me. You know, it's, it's so easy to feel that responsibility and compassion when you see someone in front of you 
who uh, is not getting the care that they need. One of the, f- the first book I ever wrote was with a physician, Terry O'Malley, and the name of the book was Inadequate Care of the Elderly. And it was uh, a healthcare approach to elder abuse and neglect because the opposite of quality of care is elder mistreatment in many cases. So, so it was really just um, within that frame. Do you think of yourself as driven by justice or health or decency or what, what goes on? What moves around inside of your mind and your spirit when you move forward? All of those are elements of compassion. And I would say what drives me every day is compassion. I I have a lot of it and uh, I see a lot of people who deserve it. Thank you. Okay, um, there you are, a nurse, geriatric nurse practitioner, a teacher of nurses, an academician, a person who sets up programs and projects within hospitals. And then all of a sudden, I hear that you're running the John A. Hartford Foundation, which for those of you who are not aware, since early 1980s, given out over $600 million to fund programs for better care and regard for older men and women. What, what's it like to be at the helm of that? Well, to be at the helm of the John A. Hartford Foundation is the biggest gift of my life. And what I want everyone to know is that the money for the John A. Hartford Foundation came from the A and P grocery stores, the great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. And John and George Hartford did not have heirs. They started a foundation and they, in their will, they said that the money should go to do the greatest good for the greatest number. And so, Uh, early on when the foundation first started making grants and we're kind of looking at the history of that now, there was, um, there were some grants that went to basic science and this was because it was before the National Institutes of Health. And so once NIH came into play, they really took a look at where they could do the greatest good and it was in aging. And so ever since then, that's our mission is to improve the care for older adults and I'm grateful for the funding I've had from the John A. Hartford Foundation. They funded the NICHE program, which is Nurses Improving Care for Health Systems Elderly. They funded the GITT program, Geriatric Interdisciplinary Team Training that I was a part of when I was at NYU. And uh, they have also, their signature program early on was Geriatric Centers of Excellence because what their goal was, was to create the leadership that would then take on the, the programs, leadership of the programs, the geriatric residency programs that exist today. So that was pretty important. When so, I joined the foundation, go ahead. Yeah, For, since many people, we've got people taking this course and watching each of these programs from all over the world, thousands of people over the coming months and years are gonna be learning from you in this session. Lots of people are always trying to raise money. Yeah. Being on the other side of the table, where you're trying to give money away, and I'm not saying people should necessarily apply for a particular grant, but what have you learned about either giving out money? What is it you look for? Or Mm -hmm. what have you learned about people who are trying to apply for money that don't get it right? Sure. And so, Ken, when it comes to raising money, I'll remind you, I was a dean for many years, and my job was to raise money. So I'm certainly very much... uh, Uh, sensitive to what that feels like. As someone who works with program officers and trustees to make grants, we look for impact. And we also look for spread and scale. And so we try to partner with blockbuster organizations like the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, where we know that a dollar to them immediately goes around the world. We work with the Education Development Center in Waltham, Massachusetts, the same thing. It's a global organization. And so we're looking for impact around our three areas of emphasis. And our three areas are creating age-friendly health systems, because believe me, when we started, there are none. There are now, but there weren't. Um, Supporting and improving the whole process of family caregiving. There are 40 million caregivers out there, family caregivers now saying, what do I do now? 
And then improving serious illness and end of life care, which not be conflated, improving serious illness, which might be dementia or end of life care, which, which might be end stage renal disease. So those are our three areas. And as you listen to them, anybody listening to this program will know they overlap all the time. So we're always looking for synergies among our grantees, among our programming, and we look for the most spread and scale we can get. With so depth. impact spread and scale, I would expect to hear those words from a corporation acquiring a startup and wanting to see if they could bring them to a national or global situation. But you think of the same words, yes. impact, spread, and scale. Yeah, we do. And we have the science. I mean, we've had the NIA since Bob started it in 1974. And so um, I think that the implementation part is where things often fall down. You've heard the statistic that it takes 17 years to get science into practice. Hopefully it's a little better now than that stat, which is not that old, but it takes too long. And so we so, need to. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you, and we've actually got a clip to, to show you and your pro, senior program officer, Marcus Escobedo at work. But in a moment, I'm going to ask you to kind of describe the four, the four M's that are a key part of, of what you're doing in terms of creating age-friendly health systems. But, but I do want to ask you, do you think of yourself as sort of a superhero? I mean, you've got, Terry, honestly, you, the, when I was going through your resume and your background, you know, and we haven't seen each other for decades, a quarter of a century. And I thought, my goodness, the amount of things that you have embraced, that you have with power and courage and compassion taken on. What is different about you? What, what, where do you, what do you call on in addition to compassion to keep pressing you forward? First of all, thank you for those kind words. No, I do not think of myself as a superhero. I have incredible tenacity. And I see that in one of my daughters and everybody in my family knows which daughter that is. Well, actually, both my, all my kids, but there's one in particular. So uh, uh, enormous tenacity. And I will go back and back and back. And I think that as I practice nursing, here's the sort of analogy. If you're with a patient and they tell you they're in pain, you'll sit with them and you'll say, is this better? If suppose their arm hurts, you say, is this better? Is this better? You don't stop until someone tells you that's better. So when it comes to the things that we in geriatric nursing believe in so strongly, you just have to use every lever and every relationship you have to make it happen. And that's where I'm at in my career right now. Thank you for that. What are you most proud of so far? And by the way, I think you're 67 now. How come you're not retired? Well, I always, people say, when are you going to retire? And I say, when they fire me. And that's a great conversation stopper because, you know, it's just, I, I, that would be ageism, wouldn't it? To say, well, I'll retire at X number. I'll retire when I feel like I'm not doing a great job or when um, I'm, if, if there's a health issue for me or my family, but what am I most proud of? My, my kids. Oh my gosh, they're remarkably fun and funny, great adults. And they have been right there for me. They have traveled the world with me as I have given what they consider very boring speeches. They have they can tell you the spices. They they tease me like crazy about age-friendly health systems. My son wears the t-shirt and they're they're proud of me, but they've been along with me all the way because as a working mother with a husband who had a very intense consulting career and was on an airplane four days a week. It took a lot of strategy and a lot of cooperation and they were right there for me. Okay, so let's go to the tip of your spear. You're trying to engender this movement towards age-friendly health systems. I'm gonna pull up something here for everybody to watch. It's a clip of you and Marcus explaining a little bit of the core of that and what that's all about. So let's take a look at you on air. 
As we've seen over the past year with the pandemic, it's very important to consider your medical care and how that might change with age. There's a lot you should know about what you can ask for when it comes to age-friendly care for you or your older loved ones. Here's Erica Vitrini with more. I'm here with Terry Fulmer and Marcus Escobedo from the John A. Hartford Foundation. It is so nice to have you here today, especially at a time when we really need to consider the older adults in our lives. Terry, tell us about the John A. Hartford Foundation. Our foundation has a critical mission and that is improving care for older adults. We do that through three approaches, creating age-friendly health systems, supporting family caregivers, and improving serious illness in end-of-life care. So Marcus, how is the foundation helping older adults? For nearly 40 years, the foundation has provided grant funding to outstanding organizations that train healthcare professionals and help doctors, hospitals, nursing homes, and health systems deliver the best care possible to older adults. And we do that through a set we call the four M's. Let's dive a little deeper into the four M's. Tell us about what matters, the first M. What matters is the heart of age-friendly care. It's about respecting a person's values and goals to ensure their care reflects what matters most to them. And Marcus, what about medication? What should we know? As you get older and you have more medications, it's important to talk to your doctor, your pharmacist, all of your healthcare providers about all of your medications, including over-the-counter drugs and supplements. Can you describe mentation? Mentation is really about your mood and your memory. That also means whether you have depression, whether you feel socially isolated, whether you feel lonely. As you get older, if you see patterns that are excessive and lead to concern for safety, then it's really important to follow up with your healthcare provider. And then the last is mobility, Marcus. Mobility is all about moving around safely to do what matters to you. Exercise is key to maintaining your mobility as you age. So talk to your healthcare team. They can help you set a plan, set goals, and improve and maintain your strength and mobility. Terry, Marcus, thank you so much for being here. And if our viewers want more information, where can they go? We welcome all of you to join us at johnahartford.org backslash agefriendly. <laughs> it's great to watch you and Marcus on air at work. So let's turn the corner a little bit more now into the subject of aging and the field of aging, whatever we're going to make that out to be. But let me ask you kind of a simple minded question in an ideal world, Terry Fulmer, ideal world. What role would older adults play? In ideal world, what would old um, so, Ken, I'm going to have you um, ask me that again. And do you mean, is there a, a tighter frame or just writ large? I'd say large, not just health related, but like what's a 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 year old's purpose in the modern age? Okay. When I think about the purpose of older adults, it seems like um, a funny question, because if your purpose until you've been 70 is to improve the care of older adults, why would that change? So I think that what we need to do is, is recognize the inherent strengths, what Linda has called the, the third age dividend, and just really do everything in our capacity to ensure that older people have, have maintained their function and capacity in every way possible. Because as people live older, you may have cancer, but if you are able to participate meaningfully and if all your four Ms are in alignment, you're gonna be living your best life. You have, focused in medicine and nursing. And there are folks who feel that the whole field of healthcare has been too oriented towards disease management, yeah. not enough on prevention. Where do you come out on that discussion? Oh, I would agree with that. I think we have focused too much on disease and not enough on prevention. I think we've gutted the public health system in this country, and there's been a rude awakening during the pandemic. And I think people are really, really uh, riveted to what we must do for health promotion, disease prevention, because it starts way downstream. And with that, um, you're gonna age in a with more function and capacity, and it'll be better for everyone. So yes, I do believe that. I also think that um, you can't turn back 
science and we are into immune, you know, immunotherapies and biologics, and it will only become more and more complicated. So I think the more that we give the comp that complex work to the people who do it best and leave the rest of the work to those of us who do it best, we'll be able to use our workforce more effectively. And you've heard the term practice to the top of the scope of your license. And that's what nurses are always advocating is, is you know, we know how to do that. Let us do it. And so I think social workers would say the same as would pharmacists and physical therapy. So pharmacists and physical therapy, in my opinion, are the stealth disciplines right now because they're coming in under the radar and they will be um, doing so much for the well-being of older people in the future. So let me ask you about words for a minute. So one of your friends and mentors, Jack Rowe, introduced the idea of successful aging a few decades ago. There are people who use the phrase anti-aging, others who talk about ageless aging. I introduced the phrase healthy aging back in 1990. Which of those do you feel a gravitational towards? Hmm. Uh, healthy aging. Because? Because it is all encompassing. When Jack used the term successful aging and he and Bob Kahn wrote that book with MacArthur grant money. Good for them. They got out of the gate with a catchy title that made people read it and say, I want to age successfully. Uh, later down the years, I mean, if you do a Google search on that term, it's been used hundreds of thousands of times. Later on, people said, well, wait a minute, isn't that pejorative? If you say that you're aging successfully and I'm not aging successfully, are you blaming me for that? So I think anything you can do to get the conversation going is a good thing. And if people say to you, you know, I, I, I believe in healthy aging, well, it invites the question, what does that mean? What does that look like? What should I do? What can I expect? So we wanted to, you know, people say age friendly, what does that mean? And it gives you such a wonderful moment to spark their attention and bring them in so that they can own it with you. Let's stay on words for a moment. Um, now that you've passed your 65th birthday, as have I, do you think of yourself as a senior citizen or an older adult or an elder or an older person or what? Which of those phrases or words calls to you, feels right? I, I certainly feel like older adult is the right term. And not only do I feel that way, but the science backs that up. Nat Kendall Taylor, who you and I had a wonderful opportunity to work with last month, uh, did the research to show that older adults like to be called just that. Do I consider myself an older adult? Yes, I do. Proud of it. <laughs> I was going to say, do you feel any proud about that? And, and you jump right in. Thank you for this that. Is, this is my gray hair and uh, <laughs> rocking it since COVID. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, to be embraced. All right. Let me dive down into this a little bit. In your early years, and I'm going to read my notes here, you wrote, your patients did not ask to be 80 or 90 years old, but the array of life-saving technologies and pharmaceuticals made them almost prisoners of the healthcare system. What were you having us look at by saying yeah. that? That phrase is jarring, and it's meant to be. You have to use jarring terms sometimes to get people to focus, because if I talk about aging, people's eyes glaze over. If I say geriatrics, they start moving out of the room. But when you talk about um, prisoners, people go, what, what did she say? Why did she say that? So it's meant to be jarring so that we can think about what it's like to be that older person in the midst of the array of healthcare options. So can... One of the great things we've learned since then is to focus on the goals and preferences of the older adults and, and the way in which their families participate. That has helped a lot when you get to what Maureen Bisignano said, not what's the matter with you, but what matters to you mm -hmm. is the, the way that she says that. Oh. And so instead of having people do things to you, at you, and don't get me started on the term, put you in a nursing home, how 
you know, that's so, so objectifying of a human being. But when you think about choice without fear. So if you say to an older person, well, you can, you're going to need dialysis. Do you want dialysis? Does anybody feel comfortable saying no if they're afraid that their doctor or nurse will abandon them? So we've come a long way, but we still have to be very much vigilant about the goals and preferences of those receiving care. So I may catch you off guard with this, but uh, so a few years ago, there was a big piece in the Atlantic written by Zeke Emanuel, who's yeah. a professor at the University of Pennsylvania and That's considered true. quite brilliant physician. Yes. Um, <laughs> And he said he is not sure that he'd want to live past 75. Yeah. What do you make of that kind of thinking? Again, I think he's just trying. I, he, he probably believes it. Zeke is a wonderful person. I've had the great pleasure to do some things with him. And, and I think he meant to be shocking. Uh, he is he is one of those people who writes in the he he writes controversial pieces and people pay attention to it. So I think that uh, he he's talking about the fact that we can't save everybody and you will not live forever. So if you go back and read the piece, he's trying to be provocative and he is, he makes some good points and he also uh, welcomes derision by saying things that are that controversial, but he's, he doesn't care. He's good with that because he is, um, as you say, he's a brilliant guy and he does palliative care for heaven's sakes. And he's an oncology physician. And so hats off to Zeke. It made those of us, and I'm not a medical professional, but it made people who are not expert like you yep. or Zeke Emanuel wonder, do docs and nurses know something about being in a hospital or being old or being treated by the medical system that if we knew it, we wouldn't take so many of the treatments? What would I you say that to that? What so what you're seeing right now is, with the aging of the boomers is they now know it because they've watched their parents and they have strong preferences and ideas about the way they want their care to go in, in many cases, not everybody, but they are expressing their opinion. They want access to their charts. They want to be able to edit their charts. If the documentation is wrong, they want, they want a different scenario. They do not see themselves as um, uh, an object. And so there's a wonderful book that Eric Topol wrote called The Patient Will See You Now. And he wrote <laughs> it a long time ago. It was like at least five years ago. And he's right. You know, it's like, hold it. Who's in the driver's seat? It's, and this is what's coming now. And we all, I welcome that. So I've got a tough question to ask you, my friend. So as we're doing these interviews, these are all folks in their 60s and 70s and Purcell's in his 80s. Um, there's been a lot of discussion for 40, 50 years now about ending ageism, creating a healthier version of aging, bringing our medical system up to geriatric competency. It does not seem like we've accomplished that. Have we failed? Whatever the royal we is, Ken, I have not failed. <laughs> So you have not failed. What I would say is that um, what's if you want to count the number of geriatricians in this country as a marker of success or failure, we we have not created the cadre we hoped we would. There's not enough. If we have created the geriatric science and if many of us in the field, like the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, know how to spread and scale that content, we're on a wildly successful trajectory. Do you, as you put on your future looking lens, do you envision that our competency and compassion regarding older adults is gonna get much better? And if so, why? Well, I think that uh, it there will be, let me put it another way. There will be a remarkable need to understand aging as people have this, what has been called the triangular, you know, the rectangularization of aging. Uh, so that many of us will end up as caregivers and nothing can make you more uh, thoughtful about aging than being a caregiver. So I think the role of caregiving, 
the shortage of caregivers, the shortage of nursing assistants in the community who can come to your home. The fact that they get paid $13 an hour is not helping, by the way. Uh, you get paid more at it like a Chipotle. So I think that uh, there'll be a reckoning coming up. And I think that people will not be surprised. And that I think that we'll be, we, we, we always come to when we need to. So probably a friend of yours, but a gentleman that I got to know a little bit decades ago, Yuvi Reinhardt, who was a professor at Princeton, used to say, guy's going out for a picnic and he's sitting by a river and he's trying to have a pleasant day, but somebody's drowning, he jumps in, saves them. Another person's drowning, jumps in, saves them. Another person's drowning, jumps in, saves them. Till he realizes there's somebody upstream pushing everybody in. <laughs> Why do we not spend more time and attention on science so that diseases, let's say like Lou Gehrig's disease, which your dad was taken down with, or Alzheimer's, which my mom was taken down with, could be beaten in the lab? Why are we so not focused on science in the healthcare spectrum? Yeah. Uwe Reinhardt is a wonderful name to bring up, by the way. What a thoughtful, loving man he was. Um, and his book about the cost of healthcare, which he published just before he died, was really special, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I think we are focused on science, but we're not focused on prevention, on public health and prevention. So if you've got something and you treat it, you, you're too late. So what the prevention and healthy people, you know, 2000 now, healthy people, 2020 going on 2030 gives us our marching orders for what we need to do in this country. And I think that that should be part of the curriculum from the time children uh, start preschool. And I think that we need to really be thinking about health promotion and disease prevention. Why should somebody consider working in the field of aging, however that's defined, with all the other things that people could do with their lives and their careers? Well, first of all, I don't want people working in aging if it's not their passion. What we do not need are people who don't embrace it, love it, and feel like they can devote their career to it. So that's the first thing I'd say. Um, and the second thing I'd say to you is, I don't know why. I love it. I can't see why. Every, I don't know why everybody doesn't do this. I just, uh, do you? No, I, can't, I actually can't. I've never encountered a subject or a phenomenon more interesting than yes. this. In it, anywhere, I feel like, how can everybody not want to be interested in this? I'm right but, there yeah, with you. You're the same. Like, I don't, <laughs> it's like, come on in. <laughs> what advice would you give to the next generation of change makers? Let's say there's some folks on the call who are 60 or 70, but there might be some 20 and 30 year olds and they're thinking, wow, here's, here's a human being who's really been doing it. What yeah. advice would you give to the next I, generation of change yeah. makers? How can they be most effective? My best advice would be follow your passion, stay tenacious, use your networks. Your networks uh, are so important, and I don't know what I would do without mine. So those are the things that I would say. You've done a little bit of thinking about leadership in addition to nursing and medicine and geriatrics, leadership. What, what can you share with us about what makes for a, a leader in this modern era? Yeah. Good leader. It seemed to me the good leaders think out loud with their immediate colleagues so that they can be consistently and constantly informed by others around them who they admire, respect, uh, and can disagree with. So that is one thing. I would say a leader needs to listen. Listening is a very important component of leadership. And making tough choices is another part of being a leader where uh, the, you know, wasn't Harry Truman that had the sign that said the buck stops here. When you're the Dean or you're the president or you're ex, you make tough decisions. Hopefully you've had the information you needed to make good decisions and then you're responsible. And I think stepping up is something that we all need to do in our respective realms. 
I'm going to ask you some questions that are a little more personal in nature about okay. aging, because back when you were 25, 30, 35, writing and talking and thinking about care of older adults, and now, as you have mentioned, you're an older adult yourself. But yeah. before we do, I'm going to read this because you know, I don't read things this often when I'm doing homework on people. You've just been acknowledged uh, as a living legend, which is, you know, pretty Marvel comics to me, by the American College of Nurses. And I read many of your testimonial letters. And there was one from Neville Strump, the Dean Emeritus of the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. And just a little bit of what she said about you. I'm going to read it. <laughs> Careful examination of her 73 page curriculum, Vita, reveals a narrative framed by practice innovation, commitment to interdisciplinary education, rigorous scholarship, and policy leadership. She described you with words such as meteoric, passionate, generous, extraordinary, and astonishing, and ended her letter by saying, Terry has not yet stepped down, but only continues to step up. So I'm not going to ask you for a reaction to that, because I know you're, you've got humility as a part of your nature, but I got to tell you, when I read it, I got emotional just thinking, wow, to be so well respected for your crusading work. But now let's go personal a little bit, my friend. Um, do you think of your own aging as having been so far an ascent or as a descent? Hmm. Um, and, and Ken, just before I do that, it's the American Academy of Nursing Oh, I you stated that wrong. Thank yeah, you for so, the correction. Yeah, just and your persistence. Okay, okay. So when I, uh, I don't think of it either way. I, I mean, I what I do is every day check in with myself, see how I'm feeling, uh, and you know, of course, with older age, you're gonna. I used to run. Now I can't. I walk because my knees and hips hurt. I, you know, there are certain things I don't do anymore. I used to water ski until I was 65. I don't do that anymore because my husband freaks out and thinks I'm going to hurt myself. And he's probably right. So it's, you know, what can you do? What can you not do? Function, function, function. And, uh, you know, using whatever capacity I have, maintaining my capacity, which at the same time, um, is you, you want to maintain and you also want to use what you have and enjoy what you can do. What about, let's step away from the physical side of aging. Do you think of yourself as wiser or having more perspective than you did when you were 30 or 40 or 50? A hundred percent. Do you? Yeah, it's been captivating because we both thought we were pretty sharp when we were young. You were much sharper than me, I believe. But <laughs> I feel like I'm only in the last few years, even during COVID, feel like I'm getting a chance to make sense of things in deeper, richer ways. Yeah. Why is that not talked about so much? Why is not the maturation of perspective and emotional intelligence more front and center in the public, in movies and TV shows and and families. Why is that no, not? Because we live in an ageist society. And Say more. Until, we, until we can eradicate ageism, that is labeling people by virtue of the date of their birth and by the color of their hair and the lines in their face, until we stop doing that, we'll continue to um, uh, have some, have a narrative of, that's full of fallacies. I know you were very responsive when the idea of the legacy interviews was suggested to you and we invited you. When you think of legacy and leaving a legacy, yeah. what swirls around in your mind as a daughter, as a mother, as a sister, as a professional, as a leader? Yeah, I'll start with as a professional and say that one of the things that was taught me very, very early was if you don't publish it, it didn't happen. <laughs> so I've been very astute about keeping my, my thinking and my science in the literature. And I would say to anybody, if you really want your legacy to be known, write it down. And whether you decide to write a novel about something or whether you decide to write uh, a scientific paper, write 
your work, get your work out there. So I would say that as a mother, what I want is healthy kids and for them to be happy and to have them remember me as a loving person, but as a fun person. I, I read those letters that went into the living legend document and that I, I cherished them. I was so touched, but not one of them indicated that I'm fun. And I'd like to think I'm fun. <laughs> <laughs> and never would say I'm fun. <laughs> All right. So let's play a sort of a mind game here. I'm going to ask you to imagine that you could travel back in time and sit with a 20 year old Terry Fulmer mm -hmm. and share with her some counsel and some guidance for what's about to unfold. What would you say? Mm. You picked a tough number, Ken, because that was a couple of years before my mother died. So what I would, so um, I would say to answer you, there will be terrible tragedy in your life and there will be wonderful joy in your life and make sure that you have a circle of loving friends and family around you to help get you through in those moments when I, um, so, um, that's, that's that answer. If you were to describe to that younger you, the incredible layers and, and impacts of your career, do you think your younger you would be surprised to imagine that that's all going to unfold or were you, did you have a feeling that that was going to happen? I had a feeling it was going to happen, Ken. You did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> How do you like that? I did. There, there was a wonderful show on Broadway, off Broadway for years called The Fantastics. Do you recall that one? Yeah, I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you know the song much more? I don't remember it. Okay. So check it out. Okay. What's the gist of it? That um, if you persevere, you'll get to where you want to go. And you don't necessarily know the end point, but keep your eyes open and your heart and mind open. Last question, my friend, for today. Um, so imagine it's many decades from now. You're gone, I'm gone, all the legacy interview subjects, we're all long gone. What was it you'd like for the world to say about Terry Fulmer? Terry Fulmer, she was a kind and caring person. Well, let me say as we close up here that um, I'm just so proud to know you uh, and I'm so proud of you and your warrior spirit, your compassion, your nursing nature, your persistence, your being touched by being so young and the death of your dad and then the death of your mom, which I was not aware of before today and building this wonderful family and trying to make big impacts on the world. Uh, thank you so much for joining me for this interview. And I wish you and your family and your projects all the best in the years ahead. Thank you, my friend. It's been a great pleasure. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs>